Today, we're discussing a recently dropped seven lessons for enterprise AI report from OpenAI. Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. A couple of weeks ago, OpenAI dropped their first ever AI in the enterprise report. Now, it was structured around seven different lessons from companies they've worked with. And given how much time and energy OpenAI is spending inside the enterprise, there's a lot to learn here around what best practices look like currently. Now, as I mentioned, they organize this into seven lessons. At a high level, the lessons are one, start with evals, two, embed AI into your products, three, start now and invest early, four, customize and fine tune your models, five, get AI in the hands of experts, six, unblock your developers, and seven, set bold automation goals. What I like about this report is that it's not framed as seven case studies, even though each of these lessons has a case study that goes with it, but instead it can almost serve as a blueprint. And if you are looking for the one singular takeaway, it's that the time for pilots and experimentation is in the past. The companies that are thriving are viewing this as a full infrastructure shift, a total transformation of how they operate and they're behaving as such. Now we'll come back to more of that at the end. But for now, let's briefly touch on each of these different lessons. Lesson one, start with evals. Use a systematic evaluation process to measure how models perform against your use cases. Now, here's how OpenAI defines evals. They write, evaluation is the process of validating and testing the outputs that your models produce. Rigorous evals lead to more stable, reliable applications that are resilient to change. Evals are built around tasks that measure the quality of the output of a model against a benchmark. Is it more accurate, more compliant, safer? Your key metrics will depend on what matters most for each use case. Now, on the one hand, this sounds pretty obvious. When you're trying to use software to get a particular result, you probably want to measure whether it achieves that result. And yet at the same time, this is such a nascent area and is frankly one of the areas that many companies don't realize they need to invest in when they go out to build, for example, agents. In fact, it's one of the areas where we see people most want to skimp on cost that we really, really don't recommend. The case study for OpenAI was from Morgan Stanley. As they looked to deploy AI models internally, they had three evals that they focused on. Language translation, measured by accuracy and quality. Summarization, evaluating how a model condensed information using agreed-upon metrics for accuracy, relevance, and coherence. And human trainers, comparing AI results to responses from expert advisors, graded for accuracy and relevance. Basically, by measuring their AI outputs based on these three different areas, they were able to have confidence and roll out these tools more broadly. To give you a little peek behind the curtain, when we were designing the voice agent that powers the super intelligent agent readiness audit, we built a comprehensive evaluation system into our work. We evaluate the voice agent on a variety of different criteria, ranging from fidelity to the interview, to wordiness and rabbit holing, and how off topic it gets, to tonality and about a dozen other things as well. Basically, all of the things that would go into making the experience feel either good or bad for a user. We also built a testing suite so that we can have different synthetically generated personas do sample interviews in order to test the models at scale. And by the way, if you look around in the AI community, there are so many people beating the drum that we need to be paying more attention to evals. Brooke Hopkins, who it looks like has an agent evaluation startup, writes, this lesson couldn't be more relevant for voice and chat AI. The risks of hallucinations, wrong escalations, or compliance slip-ups are an abstract. They're lived consequences for customer experience and brand trust. If you're deploying AI agents in customer support, evals are your safety net and compass. But let's move on to lesson two, embed AI into your products. Now, the example they use for this is Indeed, who integrated OpenAI models into their product experience for job seekers to help better explain why a particular job was recommended to them. This led to a 20% increase in job applications started and a 13% uplift in downstream success. And I think that the takeaway for other companies, and maybe what OpenAI is trying to say here, is that AI is not just a productivity suite for your employees. It's also something that can change your output and your relationship with your customers. And not just in a customer service way, although that's part of it, but also by rethinking how your products are designed from the ground up. Lesson three, start now and invest early. This one may be the most self-explanatory of all of them. They use the example of Klarna to basically show how the benefits of AI are compounding. You start small, and pretty soon you're seeing major progress and major value realized that then just expands to even more types of value and even more savings and benefits. But the process, no matter how well-intended you are, is going to take some time. Point being that the best time to start investing in AI was yesterday, but the second best time is today. Lesson four, customize and fine-tune your models. 
This is another sort of obvious one, the idea of which is basically that as good as these models are off the shelf, and they really are, there are lots of use cases where you can just zero shot and go to town. In general, especially for enterprise usage, the more context that you give it, with of course your context being data, the more you're going to be able to do with it. The list of benefits that OpenAI associates with fine-tuning include improved accuracy, domain expertise, i.e. fine-tuned models better understanding your industry's terminology, style, and context, as well as consistent tone and style and faster outcomes. Lesson 5, getting your AI in the hands of experts, is actually sort of a variant in some ways of fine-tuning. It's not the same ultimately, but it shares the common root of giving models more context to get them to perform better and in more specific and discrete ways. So the example they give is BBVA, the global banking company that has more than 125,000 employees. And basically the way that BBVA customized their experience was to allow their employees to create custom GPTs, which embedded expertise and particular contextual knowledge. Basically, they recognized that the use cases for the credit risk team, the legal team, and the customer service team were not all going to be the same. And so they encouraged people to actually build their custom implementations that had that context and the expertise and experience that existing employees had to bring to bear. Lesson number six, unblock your developers. Now, the example here they give is from Mercado Libre. That's Latin America's largest e-commerce and fintech company who worked with OpenAI to build a developer platform layer called Verdi. OpenAI writes that this platform helps 17,000 developers at Mercado Libre, quote, unify and accelerate their AI application builds. Quote, Verdi integrates language models, Python nodes, and APIs to create a scalable, consistent platform that uses natural language as a central interface. Developers now build consistently high-quality apps faster without having to get into the source code. Security guardrails and routing logic are all built in. Now, this is an interesting one because one of the things that we see all the time, which is somewhat surprising, is that developers and engineers and engineering departments are often some of the most hesitant to really fully embrace AI. I mentioned before that sometimes I think that's for not so good reasons, basically people liking their relatively slow pace of work and not wanting to accelerate. But there are also some very legitimate reasons, which have to do with the fact that a lot of the AI coding tools and coding assistants, and certainly this new generation of vibe coding platforms, were not really built with an enterprise use case in mind. Now, it is far from just OpenAI who's thinking about bringing this sort of updated coding capability to enterprises. This is exactly what new AI Daily Brief sponsor Blitzy does, basically using specialized AI agents to radically speed up and scale the enterprise development process. Factory.ai is another company that's specifically trying to bring new agentic coding capabilities to the enterprise. And indeed, while I think there's a lot of technical and product complexity here, I also think it's going to be one of the richest areas for startups in the next couple of years, so I would expect a lot more activity to flood into this area. Finally, lesson seven, set bold automation goals. And for this, OpenAI actually uses themselves. They point out basically that even as the company behind the intelligence, they're still constantly just figuring out new ways to automate their own work. I think in many ways here, what they're proposing is a mindset more than a specific use case. It's basically to always be asking for any work stream that's challenging or slow or just has opportunity that's left on the table is there a way to automate it to make it work faster, better, or cheaper? Or on the other end of the spectrum, to do things that simply weren't possible before. The point for them is not the specific examples, although they give a number. It's about the underlying principle. As they put it, setting bold automation goals from the start instead of accepting inefficient processes as a cost of doing business. I think Casper DeFi on Twitter does an awesome job of summarizing the big takeaway from all of this when he writes, AI is not another IT upgrade. It's a complete reset of how companies work. After reviewing OpenAI's seven lessons, he concludes, the real lesson, in 2025, experiment carefully is code for move too slow. The leaders are treating AI like infrastructure, not a pilot. The future belongs to companies that build, tune, automate, and iterate now. And as someone who is living inside that every single day, day in and day out, I could not agree more. For now, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Until next time, peace.